having a wonderful day. Sometimes it's absolutely amazing to have the privilege of walking around here on the earth. So let us rejoice and be glad in that. What I'd like to do in this video is look at Jesus' genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. Genealogy is a really hot topic right now. You'll see advertisements on TV for different companies like Ancestry.com that will help you research your own family tree. Did you know that if one of your grandparents was born in Ireland, you can become an Irish citizen? Who knew? Or you could do it the high-tech way by doing a genetic test to find out where you came from and what quirks they may have passed on to you. Hmm, it says here that my entire father's side of the family was left-handed in both hands. How does Matthew use Jesus' family tree to introduce his life, ministry, death, and resurrection? And why does he spend so much time on what seems so boring to us? In order to understand Matthew's introduction, let me use this video as an example. First, I need to hook you. Hopefully I've already done that as you've already watched at least a half minute and want to know something more about Jesus' genealogy and where this video is going. Second, I need to give you some credentials on why it might be worth listening to me. Well, my name is David Paris. I have three graduate degrees in theology, the highest being a PhD from the University of Nottingham in England. And since the 1990s, I've been teaching seminary and graduate level courses in theology and New Testament studies and classical Greek in the US and around the world. So if you like these videos, be sure to subscribe. That way YouTube will let you know when I post new material and show the channel a little bit of love as well and give it a big thumbs up. And don't forget that I'm giving away two copies of Mourner Hooker's book, Beginnings. If you'd like a chance to win one of these wonderful books, leave a positive comment underneath this video. And after January 15th, I'll let you know who won those books. If you want to know more about this wonderful book, you can click on the link up here, or you can look in the show more section underneath this video to learn about this book. And I'll have a link to that video. Anyways, I digress. Back to our topic. Now, Matthew is giving us a good, solid introduction in his gospel, and he uses the genealogy to hook you and give his credentials. So let's see if his introduction works better than mine for this video. In order to understand Matthew's introduction, we need to understand about genealogies. Genealogies establishes the person's lineage. This allows others to see their connections with the past that define their present standing within society. In our culture today, we place our education, experience, and accomplishments on our resume, not our family tree. Now, there's two basic types of genealogies, linear and branched. A linear genealogy is a list of names that connect one individual to an earlier ancestor. They're usually pretty narrow in scope. The key thing is to show how they tie one individual to another individual. Branched or family tree genealogies show the relationship between an individual and the wider breadth of their family relationships. Like a linear genealogy, on the vertical axis, you can trace relationships between generations. But then on the horizontal axis, you can see relationships between siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins, and so on. A great example of a branched genealogy is this one I have of the royal family in England. The goal in this genealogy is not to show you how King Charles was related to Queen Victoria, but that's in it. Rather, it's to show you all the different relationships within the royal family. An example of a branch genealogy is hinted at in the Gospels when it mentions Jesus' brothers and sisters and mother in Matthew 13. However, this type of genealogy is not developed in the Gospels. It's only hinted at. In contrast to a family tree type of genealogy or a branch genealogy, a linear genealogy is used to ground claims for power, status, rank, office, or inheritance. And this is based upon who they're related to in the past. So let's jump into Matthew's record of Jesus' genealogy, which is a linear genealogy. Matthew 1.1 reads, Biblias Genesius, Jesus Christus, we on David, we on 
Abram. Now, in English, this would be an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The Net Bible starts off with, this is the record of the genealogy, dot, dot, dot. The ESV has the book of the genealogy, dot, dot, dot. In this first verse, Matthew drops four hooks for his gospel. The first one is the first two words in the Greek, Biblios Genesius. Now, what we translate as genealogy or lineage, Genesius here, really brings across the idea of Genesis. In fact, it's the Greek title for the first book of the Torah, Genesis. Literally, Matthew opens up with the book, Biblos, the book of the Genesis. Just as Genesis serves as the start for the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, so Matthew lets us know that this is a new start, a new Genesis. It's still related to the first five books of the Old Testament, but at the same time, something new is taking place. It's new wine in old wineskins. I'd like to read a quote here from Hansen and Oakman in their book, Palestine in the Time of Jesus. In order to tell the story of Jesus, the gospel writer chose to begin with the issue of Jesus' kinship. A fundamental way for traditional societies to express kinship is to establish an individual's lineage, his or her connections to a family group that defines the present, is rooted in the past, and expresses future potentialities. This is why Matthew begins with a genealogy. Second, the second teaser that Matthew brings out here is dropping David's name. David is seen as the promised child of Abraham in Jewish thought. He is the king through whom the promises of an heir to sit on the throne and rule Israel forever will come through. Third, the son of Abraham. Abraham is the forefather of the people of Israel, the one through whom God made three promises. His descendants would be as numerous as the stars. They would inherit the land that God had shown them. And all the families of the earth would be blessed through Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Fourth, Matthew hints at David's kingdom coming to an end with the Babylonian exile. Matthew is going to mention this four times in the genealogy in verses 11, and then 12, and then twice in verse 17. So why is this genealogy so important that Matthew opens his gospel with it? It is the big headline or attention grabber for him. But when we read it today, it all sounds pretty boring. So-and-so was the father of so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so was the father of so-and-so, etc., etc., etc. Let me see if I can help you read this in a way that catches the provocative power of Matthew's introduction. Let's go back to Hansen and Occam's book. They write, In ancient Mediterranean societies during the first century, kinship was still the primary social domain. That is to say, virtually no social relationship, institution, or value set was untouched by family and its concerns. Genealogies conveyed information about inheritance rights, religious roles, and who could marry who, social standing, honor and shame, and offices of leadership. A genealogy in the ancient world did not perform one function, but they were complex social institutions that conveyed a wide range of information. So what are the most important ideas that Matthew is trying to tell us and communicate to us in this genealogy? First, the names that Matthew cites in Jesus' genealogy is sort of a summary of Israel's history. He wants to see that Jesus' lineage is centered on God's activity with the people of Israel. This is really seen in how he organizes his genealogy. The genealogy is not an inclusive list of all of Jesus' ancestors, but a very selective one. You can see how selective Matthew is if you compare his genealogy with that of Luke's. They both contain some of the same names, but differ in many areas. Now, I don't have time to discuss the differences between Matthew and Luke now, perhaps in a future video. And if this catches your interest, please put a comment down below and let me know that I should cover this in a future video. 
Now, Matthew organizes Jesus' genealogy according to three historical periods. In each of these periods, he only includes 14 ancestors. In fact, in case you miss this organizational detail, he tells us specifically in verse 17 that he did this. In verse 17, it reads, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. These three time frames are marked by three very important figures in the history of Israel. Abraham, David, and then with the return from Babylon, Zerubbabel. Now we might miss out on some of this, but someone hearing this genealogy read in church during the first century would have immediately picked up on how Matthew is linking Jesus' family line to some of the key figures and moments in the Old Testament and organizing his genealogy to cover the history of God's promises from Abraham down to Jesus. There's another very interesting facet to Matthew's genealogy, four women. In some ancient genealogies, women were included if the father had concubines or other wives in order to differentiate how their children were not at the same level as the legitimate wife. But Matthew uses these women in just the opposite fashion. It is through them that Jesus' line flows. So what do we know about these four women? In some instances, a woman brought honor to the husband's family. For example, David's marriage to Michal in 1 Samuel 18, 27. This really moved him up in the world because Michal was one of King Saul's children. So David's marriage to her brought honor into his family life and moved him up in the world. However, most of the women in Matthew's genealogy don't bring honor to the family line. Rather, they all bring huge question marks with them. The first thing to realize is that they were all Gentiles, not Jewish. So of all the women in the Old Testament, who does Matthew call forward to be part of Jesus' genealogy? The first one is Tamar. She was not Judah's wife, but his sons. And when her husband died, Judah would not give her another one of his sons to raise up a family for her. So she pretends to be a prostitute and sleeps with Judah when he is traveling. When Judah finds out that she is pregnant and has been sleeping around, he wants to have her killed. However, when she proves that the father is him, he replies, she is more righteous than I. The second woman that Matthew calls forward is Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute in the city of Jericho who protected the Jewish spies. It was her actions protecting them that gained her acceptance into the people of Israel after they took the city of Jericho. The third woman that Matthew calls forward is Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite who married one of Naomi's sons after Naomi and her family left Israel. When her husband dies, she follows her mother-in-law, Naomi, back to Canaan from Moab. But none of the Jewish men are willing to marry her or fulfill their obligation to raise up a family for her. In fact, it seems her situation is pretty bad because even Boaz, the wealthy landowner, has to command his men not to touch her when they were in the field. We're not exactly sure what was going on out there, but it was not good for her. This is when Naomi concocts a plan. When everyone is asleep on the threshing floor, after bringing in the harvest, she wants Ruth to sneak under the blanket with Boaz at night. When this wakes him up, it definitely catches his attention. So he promises to redeem her and marry her. But she has to get out from under the blanket with him before anyone else sees them. And finally, we come to the wife of Uriah. Displaying his patriarchal values, Matthew does not even use her name, Bathsheba. But you remember her story. Israel is at war. David has stayed behind in his palace. One night, he looks down from the top of the palace and he sees her bathing. He has his servants go and bring her up to the palace. 
Now you're going to hear a lot of people talk about how she seduced him. But when you're a woman all along and you are brought by the guards to the king's palace at night, you don't have much choice about what is going to take place. David then tries to cover this up by having her husband killed in battle. Now each one of these four women was a Gentile, an outsider. All four have huge question marks over their sexuality. But how each one behaved and believed in these difficult situations brought honor to them and their name in the end. Each one of them then set up and help us to understand Mary's story. She's going to become pregnant before she's married, a fact that will be raised at various points throughout the gospel stories. Even though she married Joseph, it was an accusation that was brought against her and Jesus at different points and times in the gospels. Matthew picked these four women, I think, to catch our attention, but also to set up the role of Mary and Jesus' birth. If God worked through these women in the past, then surely he can work through Mary in this instance. The Gentile background of these women also introduces another theme in Matthew's Gospel. God's promises are not for one group of people, the nation of Israel or the church. They are for the entire world. And this is seen when the Gentile Magi then visit Jesus in Matthew chapter 2, Epiphany. And this theme will carry through right to the very end of Matthew's Gospel when Jesus commands his disciples to go and make disciples of all the nations. So these women set up Mary and also important themes throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Then we hit the bombshell in verse 16. In all except for four of the generations listed in this genealogy, the line passes from father to son. And in our modern biological view, you need a father and a mother for the child to be born, the genetics of genealogy. Matthew throws this all to the wind in verse 16. Verse 16 reads, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. In the Greek here, whom is a feminine pronoun, but perhaps if we translated this as by her, we would get the idea a little bit clearer. Matthew is letting us know not only is Mary part of Jesus' genealogy, an idea that he pointed out with the four other women, but even more so, he is stating the fact that she is listed as the one whose offspring Jesus was. Matthew is stressing that Mary was Jesus' mother to whom he was born, not Joseph as his father. Matthew reinforces this idea even more with a very careful use of the verb was born. Now up until this point in Matthew's genealogy, he has used the active form of this verb. Abraham was the father of Isaac, or Isaac fathered Jacob. The active voice shows that so-and-so fathered so-and-so. In verse 16, though, he switches to the passive voice and he breaks this pattern. Joseph did not father Jesus. Rather, by Mary, Jesus was born. It makes me wonder, why does Matthew tell us this genealogy when he just really rips the carpet right out from underneath our feet in verse 16? Well, in that day, claims to family honor, rights, lineage, or so on, came through the father's side of the family. So being of the house of David and an heir of Abraham was passed down through Joseph. Second, the passing of these promises takes a very provocative turn with Mary. Now the ultimate promises come through her, by whom? And from a literary point of view, Matthew should have us totally hooked by now. How could the family line be passed down through Joseph only to make this big jump with Mary? And how could Jesus not be fathered by Joseph? What has Mary been up to? How did she get pregnant? And who is the real father? Ah, you see how Matthew has our attention now. Well, as a good author, he's going to have to answer your questions in his gospel. And we are going to have to keep reading in order to find the answers. Now, before I forget, let me remind you, I'm giving away two copies of Morton Hooker's book, Beginnings which goes into some of this material and a lot of other ideas. So leave a comment below this video for a chance to win. 
I'll announce in the video after January 15th, 2023, who gets a copy of this book. Until then, I will leave you with the word of peace. Thank you.